We're going to jump into the Old Covenant tonight just for a little bit to the book of Exodus chapter 16. You know, I, I, I've been ministering um, on what to do when it looks like God is saying no. And actually, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing a book on that subject. And it's, it's really about radical, violent faith. When I say violent, I don't talk, I'm not talking about mean or ugly. You take a hold of God because you know it's his will for whatever it is you're believing for. And you don't let go. And you just hang on for all your worth. And that's what God wants us to do. But the other day I was in prayer and the Holy Spirit just quickened this to me. So we know that, and we're looking in Exodus, 6, Exodus 16, the children of Israel has been delivered out of slavery. They were the slaves in the land of Egypt for over 400 years. God told Abraham ahead of time that would happen. Now, during all those years, 400 and some years, that's, a, that's, a, that's longer than America has been a nation. That's a long time to be in slavery. And for over 400 years, they were slaves. And, and, but they, they knew about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. They had a history. They, know, they knew they were the descendants. And, and, and they knew in their heart that God had something special for them. But yet they were slaves. It kind of sounds like a lot of Christians I know. They're still slaves. But they, they were in Egypt. And, and they began to cry out to get free. They began to cry out to the Lord. Of course, Moses, 40 years previously, had tried to help them, but he couldn't. So he left Egypt, and he's out there. He got basically married and a couple of sons, and he's taking care of sheep. And one day he was out there, and he saw a fire burning on the top of a mountain. But it didn't seem to go out. He got curious. God loves spiritual curiosity. And, and so he left the flock and he climbed the mountain when he got up there. And here was this bush, this ordinary tumbleweed, you might say. It was on fire, but it wasn't burning up. So he got up to the bush and heard a voice. And it was God. And he, and he said, you're standing on holy ground. Take your shoes off took his shoes off and God began to give him instructions on what to do for the people of Israel, uh, the, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said, I can't do that, Lord. I can't go in there and set them free. He said, no, you're not going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to say it again. You're not going to do it. I'm going to do it. We're not going to set people free. God's got to set them free. And, and God has a way of setting people free. It's not a rabbit foot. It's not throwing salt over your back. It's not doing the sign of the cross or dipping in holy water. God has a way of setting people free. It's supernatural. It's powerful. It says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And, and, and so God said, uh, you're going to set them free, and you're going to go, and you're going to tell them the great I am that I am has sent you. He said, here's, take your, your shepherd's rod, and that's symbolic of the authority of who God is, a rod of authority. So he goes back to Egypt, of course, and he tells the children of Israel, uh, God sent me, the great I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to set you free. Now, now listen to this. And the people of God laughed at him. So don't, don't expect to be welcomed with open arms when you're a messenger sent of the Lord to help somebody. God's people mocked him. Well, he, he said, that's okay. I'll go take care of this. So, of course, his brother Aaron was there, and they went to Pharaoh, and we know what happened. And the rod that became a snake and swallowed up the snakes of the serpents, and then the water turned to blood. And, and then plague after plague after plague until you finally got to the last plague where he said the firstborn was going to die unless you were in a house covered with the blood of the lamb, which is a typology of Christ, the blood of Christ on the doorpost and the lintel, uh, and you had to eat it standing up, and, and the lamb was cooked in bitter herbs. A lot of people don't understand that the lamb was cooked in bitter herbs. It, it doesn't mean it wasn't cooked in brown sugar and honey, and it, it didn't taste good. It was bitter. And then they, and, and even in the Passover, and, and that's a whole, whole nother message uh they were to eat on leavened bread and this was to be a, a a feast forever see we still celebrate the feast of the passover but not the way the descendants of abraham did because christ is our passover 
That was all typology of Jesus Christ coming to pay the ultimate price. And it, it was going to take a supernatural work. Uh, Jesus did many, 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 many signs and wonders until the time of his betrayal, suffering, crucifixion, and resurrection. That, that, that all of what he did was temporary freedom. But once he rose again from the dead, once he was made sin for us and rose again from the dead, the way to the throne was made wide open. The gate swung wide open to anybody who would come boldly before the throne of grace. So we know that finally Pharaoh let him go after the Passover. And, and of course, then Pharaoh changed his mind again. See, Pharaoh is a typology of the world, the flesh, and the devil. They're never going to want to let go of you. Just realize that you, you, you will have to be dealing with it your whole life. But the good news is Jesus overcame principalities and powers and made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. See, I used, to, I used to be a slave to the world, the flesh, and the devil. You're talking about emotional problems, suicidal, uh, uh, manic depressant. In those days, they didn't have drugs to give uh, 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 young people and now they just flood them with drugs. I'm glad I didn't live in this day with the problems I had. They would have had me on Ritalin and who knows what. But anyways, uh, tried to commit suicide numerous times. Got in trouble with the mil uh, got in trouble with the uh, law. Uh, quit school at 15 years old. Joined the Navy. Uh, right after my 17th birthday, I, I went into the Navy and I, I stepped into a cesspool of drugs and alcohol and filth. It was worse than when I was on the world, almost, you might say. But on my 19th birthday, as I was going to commit suicide, weeping and wailing and crying and feeling sorry for myself, the fear of God fell on me like a blanket. I knew I was going to hell. And I cried out to Jesus, fell on my knees. And he came gloriously in. Now, this is where we're at. So the Israelites come to the Red Sea. God splits the Red Sea. They go over. When they get over to the, into, the, into the wilderness, God sends Abraham up to the Mount Sinai and has a face-to-face -face encounter with God numerous times. And he comes back the mountain, and what did he have with him? He had the commandments, right? The Ten Commandments written with the finger of God. He brought the word of God to the children of Israel. See, they're out of Egypt, but Egypt is still in them. See, you got to listen to this. They're out of Egypt, but 400 years of influence has permeated them with unbelief. And matter of fact, if you look in chapter 16 and verse 2, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel did what? murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They murmured uh, over and over and over throughout this chapter. Actually, the word murmur is, is, is used eight times. Murmured, 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 murmured. That means they complained. They complained. They found thought. They criticized. They backstabbed. They gossiped. Now, remember, God tried to get him into the land of promise. And uh, actually, people don't realize this. God was just going to take them right into the land of promise. But they told Moses. See, a lot of people think God said, send 12 spies in. That's not how it began. Uh, they, they said, hey, before we go into the promised land, we need to know what's over there. So Moses went to God and said, hey, the people, see, people always have a good idea, don't they? No, they don't. They always have their own opinion, their own ideals of how things should work. And, and they said, hey, the people wanna, they, they want to, they want you to let us go send in some people in and check it out first. And God said, have it your way. Say, have it your way. L listen, a, a lot of people really, it, it, it's taken me over 45 years of, of just trying to purge myself from the doctrines of men, the ideals of men, of those around us. And realize some things about God. God will literally, and even when it comes to you wanting something that you absolutely should not have, God will give it to you. The Israelites, God told them in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, I'm your king. I'm your king. I'm your king. He said, but the day will come when they will want a king. And when the king comes, tell them this. Huh? A king. They said they wanted a king. Huh? 
My battery's going bad. Hey, maybe I need to get it closer. Hold on. Okay, Michael, they said the battery's going bad. Hold on. So anyways, they, they wanted a king, finally in the days of, of, of Samuel the prophet, and Samuel tried to t talk him out of it, and God said, don't talk him out of it. Let him have a king. I, I, this is so frightening. You got to realize God will let you have what you want. I've seen many believers, they want the things that were not of God. I've done it. I've got a book called I Need God Because I'm Stupid, and it's got 83 stories in it. And, and I'm telling you, dumb stuff, and most of them since I've been saved, and I, I wanted stuff. And God said, go ahead, uh, but you're, you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to get everything you can from me then. Uh, you can have what you want. You can have, the phys you can have this world. You can, but you ain't going to have the blessings of heaven. So anyway, so they're murmuring, they're griping, they're complaining. And uh, so what does God do? God says, I, I, I got to do something with these people. Now, remember, when they came out of Egypt, they, they, their clothes did not wear out. There was not one feeble among their tribe. Their shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. For, I'm sure they were upset over that. They didn't want to wear the same clothes for 40 years. And, and, and you know what? I actually don't think your, their clothes even stunk. I think it was all supernatural. So they were completely surrounded by the supernatural workings of God. So in verse 2, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said on, unto them, would to God, we, listen this, this is how they're talking. Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Listen, they said, even as God brought judgment upon the children of Egypt. He should have brought judgment on us for we wouldn't have to sit out here in this desolate place and not get what we want. If I can't have it my way, just forget it. Uh, uh, well, people don't really act like that, do they, Pastor Mike? Oh, are you kidding me? Are, are, are you really serious? <laughs> pastoring i've been pastoring for longer than i've been married and i've been married 41 years and let me tell you something have you ever complained pastor mike that's another story have you ever grumbled and griped have you ever found fault hey listen it says when we sat by the what pots it says right there in, in king james it says maybe you have another translation my the trans the king james says flesh pots anybody else have another translation in niv or something Pots of meat. We want meat. We want flesh. We're, we're, we, we want flesh. And, and notice, and when we did all eat bread to the full until we were stuffed, for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. L listen, they're, they're accusing, of course, Moses and Aaron, but it, it, it's not Moses and Aaron. God did it. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, listen, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Bread from heaven, bread from heaven. Actually, uh, in, in the book of Psalms, it's called angel food. That's what it's called. Let me just read that scripture for you. Uh, in Psalms uh, 78, verse 23, though he commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven, so it's called the bread of heaven, the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. And he sent them meat to the full. So God gave them angel food. Uh, and I'm going to make a couple statements here because we want to talk about manna tonight or bread from heaven. Exactly what is it? I think most of us realize already that manna from heaven is symbolic a typology and illustration of the word of God. It is the word of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, you did eat, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness. He said, but the bread that I give you, which is my flesh, will give you everlasting life. So the manna or the bread from heaven or the corn of God or the, the food of angels, listen to this. It is, it is symbolic of the word of God and Jesus Christ. And Jesus said this. He said, 
except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no zoe in you. You do not have zoe. Now, you might have natural life, but you do not have zoe life. You don't have, Jesus said, I'm come that you might have zoe and have it more abundantly, or life as God has it. Uh, what exactly would be the life of God? Let me tell you what the life of God is. It is the divine nature of God. It's the character of God. It's the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. And against such there is no law. That, that's, 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 that's what it is that we hunger and thirst for. That when we see him, we'll be like him. And every man that has his hope purifies himself even as he is pure. Now, don't misunderstand me. Uh, all of the other promises and blessings and provisions of God meeting our physical needs, emotional needs, all of these natural things. Yes, he, he'll put clothes on your back. He'll put natural food on your table. He'll put a roof over your head. He'll protect you. All of these things. But really what it is that we want to apprehend is the divine nature of God. It is the character of God. It is, it is the personality of God. That's what we're wanting to apprehend. Remember, and he says, and, and Jesus, he, 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 he said, man should not live by bread alone, but what? Every word that comes out of the mouth of God. The word that comes out of the mouth of God. The word that comes out of the mouth of God is the manna for the believer. Because when he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's not talking about his physical flesh or his blood, but he's talking about the word and the spirit. Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So that's, that's symbolic of the, the word of God. And it's, it's living word. Because remember now there's, and you can read all of chapter 16. And you can look up the word manna. And actually, God didn't give the bread of heaven or the corn of, of, of heaven or the corn of God or the food of angels, he didn't give it the name manna. You know who gave it the name manna? The Israelites did. And do you know what it means? It's actually in this particular set of scriptures in verse 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, because here comes the manna like rain, it's coming, it's coming down from heaven. And it says, when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, it is manna, for they wist not what it was. In the Hebrew, it means, what is it? And actually, it, it wasn't, it didn't look desirable. It, it looked almost like big fluffy snowflakes coming down. Uh, it had no leaven in it. You know, natural bread has, has leaven. And, and, uh, but they, they were required to eat unleavened bread, unleavened bread. If you've ever seen it, it's like a wafer, like a cracker or something like that. There's no, there's no leaven in it. There's no fluffiness in it. There's no, you know, how many like real homemade bread right out of the oven with lots of butter on it. I do. It's not against the will of God. No, it's against the will of God. If you eat a whole loaf at a time, I know, but I, I like homemade bread, but you know what? This had, this had no leaven in it. This manna, this manna, what is it? What is it? And, and actually, you'll find out if we had time tonight, and we don't, that the Israelites got fed up with it. They didn't want it. They wanted, they wanted something more. They just didn't want the manna. The manna wasn't enough for them. See, it wasn't enough for them. Why do you think churches have gone into so many fun activities? Because man is not enough for them. Christ is not enough for them. They, they got to they gotta have something more than just Jesus. I got to have something more than just Jesus. You just preach Jesus. You, you, you worship Jesus. You, you talk about Jesus. You, 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 uh, you sing about Jesus. You worship Jesus. It's Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the new time. And Jesus, when the sun goes on, and, and we want some more. We, we want the three stooges. We want Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and, 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 and uh, Fudd, whatever his name was. Elmer Fudd, the road runners. We, 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 we got to have games. We got to have fun. We got to, and, and, and you know what? what and you know, God, they wanted meat, so God did. He gave them quail. So much quail to where, they, and they were so much in the flesh where they literally did not even, some of the people didn't take time 
to, to, to cook it. They would just rip it open and eat it raw. People can be that. Now, you and I could say, oh, I'll never do that. Well, listen, um, you go without what you consider good food for a while. And all of a sudden, let me, let me tell you something. I was so stupid. I, my wife, she prayed for me one time. This was many years ago when I was still pastoring here, but probably fit, maybe 25 years ago. And I wasn't living. To, I mean, I was living for God, but I wasn't on fire. I had lost my zeal. I had gotten caught up into just counseling people and all the activities a pastor can get caught up in. She began to pray and fast for me. Anoint. She began to cry out to God for my soul. She never, she never, not one time. I do not remember one time my wife ever, ever harping on me to pray, to seek God, to do the will of God. Not one time. My wife is not a complainer a murmur or a griper, hallelujah. But she could pray, and she prayed me into the kingdom before I ever knew her, and she began to cry to God for her husband to be when she was 10 years old. So anyways, I come home one night, and I laid my head on the pillow. She's sleeping because I was counseling somebody, and all of a sudden, the, 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 the God hit me. The power of God hit me. I fell on my bed weeping and willing and crying. I could not stop praying and weeping and crying for 40 days. I could not eat for 40 days. All I could do was drink water. Now, I've tried to go on long fast myself, and I've gone 21 days at times with nothing but water, but I've never been able to go 40 days with nothing but water. It was supernatural, and I didn't even like it. But I couldn't help it. Her prayers, that's, don't tell me that God doesn't answer prayers. Don't tell me that God, uh, that, that, that as you pray, the power of God won't fall. It will if you get serious. And she had cried out and said, God, you got to do something with this guy. You sent him to me. You gave him to me. And she began to anoint everything. And the power of God hit me. And she didn't tell me that until after the 40 days. She didn't go, nah, 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 nah. I prayed this on you. <laughs> you know, I I'm sure she'd been afraid what I would have done. I don't know. But after, so I get done with my 40 days. Now, you won't believe what I did. I was just as bad as these guys. 40 days, I haven't ate. You know what I did? I went out and had a big steak with a baked potato. And listen, my heart literally stopped beating. Literally, my heart stopped. I was dying. I mean, I shoved the steak in my mouth, put the potatoes. I mean, I ate like a pig, and all of a sudden, my heart stopped beating. And God said, you better cry out for mercy. You just killed yourself. And I've heard of people who've gone for 40 days, and all of a sudden, they ate food. They sh I should have just started with a little bit of soup. You understand? And you're talking about being sick. So I'm not mocking these guys. Sue, you, you can't believe what your flesh should do if you let it get away with it. That's why you got to crucify it. You got to mortify it. You got to put it under. But did you know that the Bible says that manna is the food of angels? So let me ask you something. Do, do, do angels eat physical food? Don't answer that right now because I know in the old covenant angel would show up and eat with them, okay? But you know what? It, it says there's an, actually a scripture. I love this scripture. And it says uh, in Psalms 103.20, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, that hearken unto his word. Uh, see, I truly believe because angelic beings, they're holy, they're righteous, they're pure, they're sinless. Now, I'm not talking about the devils that fell. I'm talking about angels are sinless. What gives angels strength? You know what it is? It's the word of God. I believe it. It's God's word that causes angels to maintain their eternal, consistent presence of who they are they hearken to the word of god they fulfill the commandments of god they listen to the word of god uh, one of the first books i ever wrote was called the chronicles of micah and i tried to give an illustration and it's actually the first three months of my christianity but i made it a, a a fiction and i show a guy by the name of micah who's committing suicide angels are trying to rescue him demons are laughing and encouraging him he gets gloriously saved and throughout the book you're going to find out that whenever micah was seeking god hungering after god doing the will of God the angels were having the time of their life I mean they're just doing supernatural protecting him helping him doing all kinds of things but whenever that Micah would go astray and not listen to God and not agree with God's word and not obey God the devils rejoiced and the hands of the angels were tied and the angels stood there in the background and they couldn't do a thing 
angels hearken to the voice of God. Well, do you know we were created to be in the image and the likeness of God? And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So what is it that gives the believer strength, wisdom, faith, uh, renewing of the mind, uh, uh, opens the door for miracles and signs and wonders. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I've been writing my memoirs. It's going to take me a long time. I've only got the first two books done, and I've got enough material right now for five or six books with 400 experiences in each book. I've got all the experiences either already written out or just a little bit. And, and, and I take you through my life, and I show the good and the bad through my memoirs. It's called The Lifetimes and Adventures. Uh, of Doc Yeager <laughs> and I'm not exalting myself because people need to see how this works and I and 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 so as I'm putting together this book right now about uh, 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 about uh, 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 faith that will not take no for an answer I'm going to have over a hundred radical radical stories of amazing acts of God's divine intervention as I was moving in faith you know where that faith came from came from the word of God because the moment I got born again, no one taught me this because I wasn't surrounded with any mature Christians. I wasn't, for the first probably four years of my walk with God, I, I didn't know any, very few Christians and, 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 and to mature to say, no, not really. Most of them were fleshly, worldly, carnal. They were more caught up in this world than the things of God. And, and you know what? It was the word of God. I ate it. I, I still do. I eat it. I sleep it. I drink it. The word of God. The word of God. The word of God. And, and, and man should not live by bread alone. But see, these Israelites, they came out of Egypt, but they had some major, major issues. So what was God's solution? I'm going to give them what? The word. Moses brought it to them, even though it's the old covenant. He brought him the covenant. He brought him the word. And, 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 and then he gave him manna, which is symbolic for Christ. So what, what, what will change us? Now, remember the first generation, they died. They got their wish, all oh, that we would have died. God said, okay. You know why? Because they despised. It says they ended up despising manna. They despised it. They, they did Everything they needed was in the manna. Say, everything I need is in the manna. Listen, every, all the books I, God's allowed me to write, they all point you back to one thing, God's word. God's word, no secret sauce, no special formula, no magical quote. No, it's just nothing but the word of God. But at this moment, to a great extent, how do I know that uh, most people in the body of Christ today that I know, they despise the word? What do you mean they despise the word? They, how many of you know that whenever you go to a food bar, food you don't like, what do you do? You avoid it. Why are people avoiding God's word? It says, oh, how I love thy law. This is my meditation all the day. How, I mean, people love preachers more than God's word. Why do people despise the word? They despise the truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You know, like I said, I've only written books about Smith Wigglesworth because he was a plumber that learned how to read from his wife, Polly, who just used the Bible. And so all of the days of his life, even in his older years, well, uh, he could read, but all he ever did was read the Bible. No, I'm not saying that's all you got to do. There's a lot of good, you got to be careful, but there are a lot of good books out there that can help you grow because God's given the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. But Smith, he had all that word in his heart, and when he finally got filled with the Holy Ghost in his late 40s, and, and he began to step into that realm of faith because he wasn't a man of faith, and all of a sudden you see. So he, you might say that Smith came out of Egypt all those years ago as a young boy, but he didn't really step into the promised land into his 50s. He didn't really. But see, the first generation rejected God's word. The second generation that was in the wilderness with mom and dad, guess what? You know what? Um, you go into, like, when I go to the Philippines or, like, I took, uh, uh, I've gone to Great Britain. Man, when I go to Great Britain, 
the only thing I can handle, now I, I eat whatever they give me because the Bible says that when I'm with the Philippines, I, in the Philippines, I don't even ask them what they're feeding me. I don't want to ask them. I think sometimes they fed me big uh, uh, fruit bats and stuff like that and, and dogs. I'm not kidding you where I was at. I mean, but when I go to Great Britain, I, it's like I got to hold my nose and shove it in my mouth and eat their food because because it, it's not like my mom's home cooking, you know, German. Uh, Ger my, we were Germans in Wisconsin. And so, you know, sauerkraut and pork, you know, and 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 and, and fried chicken and mashed potatoes, you know, and I mean, that's what we'd like. I remember my son Daniel and I, we were down in a little country called Suriname on the other side of the Amazon and they were feeding us all of their native food and I said I'm gonna make the most marvelous meal you've ever had they said really so I went to the local store and I bought a bunch of little chickens and we got potatoes and I made them a traditional American barbecue mule a meal meal a meal meal I fed them I mean I mean and so I got it all done I barbecued it and I said here we go and and they looked at it, looked at me, looked at it. And, and I thought, man, I'm not going to get much of this. They're going to eat it up. You know what? They won't eat it. Man, me and Danny, we're eating barbecue chicken, man. I go, whoa, they roasted. Oh, this is so good. And they won't eat it. You know why? Because of their taste buds. Their taste buds. Your taste buds have to be developed. You know what? You got to develop a taste for the word of God. You can if you force feed yourself. You got to develop thy words were found and I did eat them and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart for I'm, 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 I'm called by your name. You got to force feed. You got to renew your mind. This, the first generation never developed a, a, a love for manna. And they died. In the wilderness. The second generation developed a love for manna. The second that's all they knew. And a lot of them were even born in the wilderness. And the first thing that mom and dad did, they shoved that manna in, 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 in their baby's mouths because babies could eat it. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And they shoved it in their mouth, and, uh, and it tasted like honey wafers. And, and they, they, they started eating that manna and that symbolic of the word of God. And then they, and then they would have the reading of, of, of the covenant that God had given Moses. And, and that's how they were raised, and that's what they knew, and that's what they loved. And so when they... So when finally the second, first generation died off, God gets them to the Jordan River, and God says this to Joshua, Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate upon it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with you, whithersoever thou goest. And Joshua, in that generation of word, they were word people. They, all they knew was the word of God. They didn't know Egypt. Most of them had never been in Egypt. If they were, they couldn't remember. They were too small. And now they go in, and guess what? They take on the, the giants and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amalekites and, and the Amorites and all of the other wicked uh, people of, of that, 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 them, them nations, and, and God gave them tremendous victory. But it was the word of God. 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 They ate manna. They ate manna. They ate manna. No, it, it, it's not just, see, you, you just don't put man in the mouth. You got to get it into your belly and your belly and you got to digest it, right? If you don't digest your, your food, you puke it out, don't you? You vomit it out if you don't digest it. So it's not just the word of God here. You got to get it here. And in your stomach, there is, there is uh, God created your stomach to take that food and it begins to dissolve it. And you, your body begins to assimilate it. And before you know it, you begin to look like what you eat. <laughs> Don't we, Howard? <laughs> he just looked down at his belly too. This year, by faith, I'll get rid of 50 pounds this year. Not if I don't stop eating who I am because my, my daughter's making faces at me like, yeah, right, Dad. <laughs> okay, by faith, I'll take it. Okay. See, you got to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only to saving yourself. We've, we've got to get the word of God deep inside of our heart. Listen, God said this prophetic word in Deuteronomy 8, 3. This is what he spoke to the children of Israel. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna. He, he purposely put you in a position where 
he could give you manna. God will try to position you where you have to go to the word or you'll lose your mind. Average pastor is not lasting two years now in the church. I haven't looked up the stat lately, but even when my wife and I were pastoring in Three Springs, Pennsylvania, back in 1979, 1980, 1981, the average for a pastor in the Assembly of God denomination was two years. The average. Why, why was that, Pastor Mike? Because the grass is always greener on the other side. Going to move on somewhere else where it's not so hard, it's not so tough, it's not so rough, where people will appreciate me, where people will love me and treat me with respect, where people, where people will, you know, and so they, every two years, because they're, they're, they're I'm not saying they're hirelings. I'm saying they're not hearing from God. Listen, I, I, I'll be honest, 37 years, I've tried to leave here. I've tried to leave here, and God won't let me. I didn't choose to be a pastor. God called me to be apostolic and a pastor. That's what God called me to do. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's not easy. Pastoring today is not easy because so many people are way more worldly-minded than heavenly-minded. And... The Israelites, listen to this, we get ready to close here. They were exalting Egypt. They were exalting the garlic. Listen, this is what they complained about. This is what they said. They said in Egypt, there was garlic and there was fish and cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions. See, see where their mind at? Taste buds. What tastes good. We, we, we can't handle this manna. We, we can't manna, preaching Jesus all the time, preaching the truth all the time, preaching the word all the time, pre preaching, you know, now you might like it because you developed a taste for it like the second generation did. The second generation developed a taste for truth. Let me, let me ask you, have you developed a taste for truth? Can, can you... I mean, is that really, you got to, now, if you don't have right now, because we're not just talking to you, we're live streaming, and it'll be up on the internet. If you don't have a taste for the truth, then you're going to have to start force feeding yourself. It's like when someone is physically sick, they got to force feed them, don't they? Uh, they're, they're, I, I've dealt with people who are physically sick, maybe at times my children, and we would, we would, we would, con we'd have to put spoon feed them, spoon feed them. Now, I, I won't mind spoon feeding you, but the thing is uh, that the sooner you can pick up your spoon and start feeding yourself, the better off it is. But you got, you got to get the truth inside of you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed, be changed, metamorphosis like a caterpillar to a butterfly or a tadpole to a frog, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How? It says, I beseech you, therefore, brother, mother, mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, and be not conformed to this world. Don't be like the Egyptians. Don't be like the Israelites murmuring and griping and complaining and, and looking at all what's wrong with you. Now, we acknowledge if we got problems. I just preached a sermon last Thursday. Lord, what's wrong with me? Okay, so we look at what's wrong with us, but then what do I do to overcome what's wrong with me? I look to the great I am, the great I am. Yeah, we're slaves, but I'm looking to the great I am. You know, Caleb and Joshua, they said, because uh, uh, the other 10 spies, because see, their leaders were a mess. They sent 12 spies in. They took them from the leaders of their 12 tribes, and 10 of them were a mess. If you're following leadership that's a mess, you're going to end up just like them. I won't tell you names. I, I, I don't really listen to a lot of preachers. I'm open to be taught. So the other day, I, I won't mention him as a very, very well-known preacher I be, I, because he was preaching along the line of something I was studying, uh, uh, and, and I began to listen to him. And as I listened and as I listened, my heart really sunk. Now, I'm not judging his heart. I'm judging his words. Well-known preacher, well-known. I had to shut him off. See, because I, I believe that it's God's will to heal you every time. 
and he was saying well god doesn't always heal so don't get upset don't god heals every time if you'll get a hold of god god will get a hold of you there's no condemnation in this thing there's freedom for anybody who's willing to pay the price to get on their face into the word see i believe on getting on your knees in prayer with your face in the book and eat the manna and eat the manna and eat the manna and eat the manna i i I don't know if my son daniel likes me sharing this story but it don't matter back in 2011 he came to me and he no yeah 2010 dan or 2011 and he said dad what can i do to grow spiritually and i told him daniel eat the word how meditate on it find scriptures eat it and eat it and eat it and i watched him for at least three months and he did it every time i'd see him he'd be walking the word i don't know if he still believes this but he'd be speaking the word and speaking the word and speaking the word i watched him supernaturally change now my daughter stephanie she was never really much i mean she's always been a godly young woman but back four years ago stephanie you began to take the word four years ago she began to take a hold of the word and she just began to eat it and she said to me one day she said dad i can't memorize the word like you i said well can you put a song to it and she now she has a youtube channel and she teaches people the word by singing and she has literally and i am so upset she's memorized so many scriptures i don't know she has and she'll sing them to me and she'll preach them at me and 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 i've seen god answer amazing prayers that she has prayed just simply out of her heart because angels hearken to the word of the lord but probably up to four years ago she did not see the importance of god's word but now she's had a revelation haven't she of god's word and how important it is and that revelation has got to come back to the church it, it's got to come back. And so we'll close with this. He says, and he humbled thee and suffered thee hunger and fed thee with manna, fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. Okay, so your, my parents didn't know the word of God. My grandparents didn't know the word of God. In my community of Maquanico, Wisconsin, which was uh, like between Waukesha and Chicago, I didn't know anybody who knew the word of God. But when I got gloriously born again, God put it in my heart, and I began to devour Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I began to devour it. Pastor, how can you write so many books because of God's word that I hide in my heart? All the time. All the, now, I don't think it's so spiritual. How, how many of you have ate natural food today? Let me see your hands. How many of you, when you get home, might have some food? Let me see your hands, some of you. <laughs> how many will have food when you get up tomorrow? How, how many of you probably have ate every day of your life as far back as you can remember? It's natural. See, what I'm saying is it ought to become that way with God's word. Get into a routine of hiding God's word in your heart. Then we've got to be doers of it, not hearers only. Okay, you, you got to ask God to quicken that word to you. But he said, I gave you manna that you didn't know and that your parents didn't know. It says that he might make thee know that man does not, not, does not live by bread alone only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. So did you hear what he just said? He, he said, I, want, I, I put you in a situation where you were going to have to eat what I gave you that you could learn that you live off of what I say. You live off of it. Now, what does that mean to live? Your physical body is living right now be, uh, on what you have fed it. Your body is, you're, you're living off of what you're eating. Okay, so mentally, psychologically, emotionally, we should be living off of what God has said. What did God say? You ask most people if they want me to counsel them and they'll say, Pastor, what should I do? And I'll go, what does God's word say? They say, well, I don't know. I said, well, look it up. I can't give you more than what God's word says. I don't have anything other than God's word and his spirit. What does God's word say? How am I supposed to treat my wife? How am I supposed to treat my children? How am I supposed to minister to people? How am I supposed to pray? You know what? Uh, a lot of people pray prayers filled with their problems. God never told us to pray our problem. 
God never told you to talk your problem. God never told you to exalt your problem. God never told you, do, well, do I ignore it? No, you come against it. You have a thought, you have an idea, you have an emotion. This stuff affects you everywhere mentally. Uh, one quick story. Back in 1981, I think it was, 8081, uh, I had memorized a good amount of scriptures and meditated on them. And one morning I got up and I prayed the word of God in my prayer time. So now we're talking, you know, how many years ago? 40 years ago. Well, I couldn't remember a scripture. I couldn't remember it. It confused me, and I sat on my mouth. Wow, I, I, I can't remember that scripture. So I went back to prayer, and another scripture that I usually quote was gone. And another one, I said to my wife, I said, Honey, I, I don't know why, but I'm not being able to remember scriptures. I, I'm losing them. And this went on for two weeks to where I couldn't hardly remember any scriptures, any I didn't know what was going on. Of course, the devil would say, you got Alzheimer's, but I was too young, you know. I wasn't even in my 30s. I was in my 20s. And so what I did is one day I'm in prayer, and I'm saying, Lord, and I asked him, I said, Lord, what is going on? Now, this is what he said to me. He said, son, it's easy. I said, what? He said, you are simply getting what you're saying. I want you to see the trap. So the devil can get you. Now, I'm talking to myself. I'm not telling people talking to, I don't know why I don't know what I can't remember of course then I told my wife I don't I didn't tell anybody else and all of a sudden it's like the devil came and sucked it right out of my head and and I said what Lord I said it can't be that simple he said it is he said you are getting what you're saying and it's opened the door for the devil to rob from you your mouth gives the devil permission to rob from you your mouth gives permission for the angels to hearken to you I really don't tell angels what to do. I just simply speak the word and they hearken to the word. I don't put angels around my car. They're there. They're there. I bind the devil. I take authority. I say we will have a safe trip going there and coming back. Lord, I thank you no mechanical problems. And God takes care of it. So anyways, I repented right then and there. I said, Lord, I am so sorry. I, I said, Lord, I won't do that again. Lord, I thank you. I've got the mind of Christ. And did, as I'm praying right there, it was like the heavens opened up and all the scriptures came flooding back into my mind. Boom, 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 boom. So I didn't tell anybody about three weeks ago. Now, I've never experienced that from that time to this. So here it is 40 years later. Three weeks ago, all of a sudden, I began to experience the same thing. But I've learned my lesson. Guess what I did? I didn't acknowledge it. I didn't confess it. I just plowed my way through that time because it was an attack of the devil. And guess what happened? All the scriptures came pouring back in, came pouring back in. So let me ask you something. Are you eating manna? or onions and garlic and leeks, whatever that is, and fish. I'm not against that natural stuff. I'm just saying, what are you, uh, are you looking to get your substance, your wisdom, your help? Is your hope, is your future built on God's word? Now, everywhere we look in the church, storms are hitting everywhere when you see people's lives fall apart now falling apart doesn't mean you ain't going to go through a problem no we all have opportunities i call them opportunities uh but if you're falling apart and 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 and, and you're just out of your mouth is coming death and fear and anxiety and hurt and pain and frustration if that's what's coming out of your mouth, if that's what's coming out of your heart, that's what you've been putting in there. And, and you, bet, you better stop because I used to be a pilot. You're in a nosedive and you got time to pull up. But if you don't start pulling up, you're going to hit the ground. And I told my wife the other day because it's people are building their Christians are building their lives on sand. Oh, on sand. They're building their lives on their jobs, their health, uh, their savings account, people's opinions, what's going on in the government. And when the wind, the rain, and the flood hits, boom, they're gone. 
No, I mean they're gone. Just It just sweeps them away. What do we do? Build your life upon God's word. So, Father, I thank you this word will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing where unto you sent it. In Jesus' name, amen.